just months after Hurricane Katrina decimated New Orleans. The Gotti boys fled the tougher Texas legal system and returned home. New Orleans was destitute. 80% of the city had been wiped out. Of the city's original population, only about half returned. I was messed up in the head. I was hurt. I thought it was over with. So when people come back to New Orleans with the attitude of like saying, you know, F the world, I feel them. Because that didn't supposed to happen to us. The floods damaged or destroyed nearly 200,000 homes and apartments. Many of the city's blue-collar workers were homeless. Some businesses, desperate for help, began offering signing bonuses. Even the Gotti boys felt the economic crunch. After Katrina, the economy wasn't where it needs to be, so you had a lot of dudes resorting to violence as far as hustling, robbing. A lot of the drug trade, that started back up. The violence started back up. And there was a new problem. Increased competition in the drug market. Some gangs with Houston connections, like MS-13, saw a wide open market and began trying to move in. They flooded New Orleans with every drug imaginable. So now it become a turf war. The guys that have been on this set all their life, this being threatened by the dudes a couple of blocks down because the lights ain't was on in this area yet. In post-Katrina New Orleans, turf quarters no longer existed. Everyone wanted to rule the least damaged parts of the city. Suddenly, neighborhoods that had always seemed safe, like the French Quarter, were caught in the crossfire. It don't matter where you see me at, where I see you at. Because I know one thing, if you catch me down, you're going you're gonna to do me. But if I catch you before you catch me, it's all good. The old alliances remained strong. And before long, the gangs from the Third Ward resurfaced. The Gotti boys came back even stronger than before. You got to come back. And me and you washing cars on the same corner, we got a problem. Because you cut into my money. It's how I feed my family now. So what you do, you walk around a project scrap with guns all day. Tension is that high. The city was ruled by survival of the toughest. The more you had, the more you were a target. We start making money. So, you know, you looking, you looking good to other people that don't have money. You see what I'm saying? Looking like fresh meat or whatever. And people said, mother of God, what have we created? In June 2006, the Big EZ was shaken to its core by one of the bloodiest killings in the city's history. Just before dawn, five teenagers were sitting in an SUV less than two miles from the French Quarter when they were assassinated in a hail of semi-automatic gunfire. Oh man, it, man, it wasn't no, no bad kids at all, bro. At all, man. It, they was kids. They was kids, man. Still living with their mom and daddy. Authorities believed the murders stemmed from an altercation over drugs. One of the police chiefs told one of my relatives that during his whole tenure on the police force, he never witnessed a murder where it was like five people at one time. Nobody lived to tell a story or nothing. One month after the slayings, anonymous phone calls and a street-level informant led police to Michael Anderson, a 19-year-old with nine felony arrests. He was charged with five counts of murder. A key witness in the case refused to cooperate, and all five murder charges were dropped. Were it not for heroin possession charges, Anderson would have gone free. It was proof that no matter how much Katrina had reshaped the city, the old New Orleans code of silence still ruled the streets. It's a societal thing here in the impoverished community that don't speak to authority because authority has failed me. 
The slayings forced then-Governor Kathleen Blanco to call in the National Guard to help control the violence. You had the National Guard, you had the federal police, you had the NOPD, you had all type of agencies coming from around the United States just to get a grip on the crime, just to get the city back up and rolling, man. But control was slipping from their grasp. In the year following Katrina, the murder rate jumped by 69%. But the crippled judicial system brought about only one conviction. I think New Orleans is one of the worst places as far as murders and drugs you could ever be in. Period. Ever. New Orleans, 2006. Devastated by Hurricane Katrina, the Big Easy struggled to get back on its feet, while a crime epidemic threatened to destroy the city. New Orleans had never had a sizable Latino population, but now thousands of immigrant workers were pouring into the area, hoping to cash in on the opportunity to rebuild. Their presence unnerved the Gotti boys. I ain't racist enough, but the Mexicans, man. They, they like everywhere. Many of the Latinos were illegals who didn't speak English. With no legal IDs to open bank accounts, they were known to carry large amounts of cash, which made them prime targets for gangs. And we call them the walking ATMs because they'd be getting shot or shot at and robbed. They were targets for another reason. The Gotti boys feared the new residents were trying to take over the drug market. You're a foreigner. And how you gonna come down here and control our market? It's a small market, but it's ours. Now you're gonna come out here, you're gonna steal cars, and you're gonna do, you're gonna do all this little petty shit to try to get known, of course. Let's see if you stack up some bodies. Rumors began to circulate that the Latinos were banding together for protection. It was the authorities' worst nightmare. And the last thing New Orleans needs are these black drug distribution networks slugging it out against a Latin gang. The city was spiraling out of control. So in September 2007, the federal government intervened with a drastic move. Hoping to avoid the growing gang violence, they ordered four of the city's flood-damaged housing projects to be demolished, including the Magnolia and the Calio. I'm like this. You turn down these projects to do what? To modernize our city? All right. But you might take 3,000 people out of one project and replace it with 1,000. What a mad at? What a mother 2,000 people going at? Though portions of the MELF are still standing, the landscape of the Third Ward has changed. For the Gotti boys, it's like losing part of their extended family. When they tore it down, you know, they, they tore part of me down, you know what I'm saying? The federal government plans to replace some of the low-income housing with mixed-income neighborhoods filled with townhouse-style apartments. The Gotti boys say this poses a threat to their old hood and its way of life. You're creating poverty. 